Rejoice, Jerusalem, and all who love her. Be joyful, all who are in mourning. Exult and be satisfied with her consoling prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned, in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconciled the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. But others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, How were your eyes open? He replied, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I wash, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him, since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, he would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, He is of age. Question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one comes from. The man answered and said to them, This is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin, and you were trying to teach us. Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see, and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you were saying, We see, so your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. You know, as far back as I can remember, this is the first Sunday I have ever been to or celebrated Mass. 
in an empty church. From the time I was a little boy all the way to just this last week, it has been my constant experience, my constant solace, and my constant joy to gather at the Lord's holy altar on Sunday with his holy people. And yet all of that has changed today. My heart is sad as I think about all of you, the Catholic faithful near and far, sitting at home today rather than being here for the great sacrifice of praise. Now don't get me wrong, it's good that we are safe and that it is good that we are taking the necessary precautions, but it is not good that we are not all here this morning. It is sad. Today's a sad day. And yet ironically, on this very sad day, the first Sunday of what I'm afraid will be many sad Sundays, we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Lent, which is called Laetare Sunday. This word, word Laetare, it's the first word of our introit from the Mass, our entrance antiphon, and it comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And this word itself, Laetare, is the first word of the antiphon, and it's the Latin imperative meaning rejoice. Listen again to the words of Isaiah. Laetare, Jerusalem. Rejoice, Jerusalem, all you who love her. Be joyful, all who are in mourning. Exalt and be satisfied at her consoling breasts. Interesting words for us on such a sad day. But before we play with this a bit, let's first stop and consider them in what would normally be their proper context. Imagine that Lent has gone the way that it has always gone, the way that we expect it to. At this point, four weeks in, we would have all been a little raw, a little weary from our fasting and our praying and our almsgiving, and we'd likely have a bit of Lenten fatigue at this point. Four weeks of sackcloth, four weeks of ashes, would have brought us to this day, this Laetare Sunday, wherein the Church would invite us to take a brief hiatus from our austere Lenten penances and practices in order to revel a bit in the joy that we know is coming at Easter. The liturgy for today reflects all of this. The somber Lenten purple is lightened up a bit, giving us a rose color to help lift our spirits. The prayers of the texts of the Mass are a little more joyful in nature. And usually the organ is pepped up a bit today and flowers are brought in for the altar just to add a little bit of festivity. Laetare Sunday, even though it's only for a day, is meant to be a reprieve. It's meant to help us keep everything in perspective and to realize that the outcome of our penance and repentance, the outcome of the ashes and the cross, is nothing less than our joyful liberation from the shackles of sin and our rebirth to new life in Jesus Christ. This is the paradox of our Christian faith, that from death comes life, and that is why we rejoice. But Laetare Sunday has a slightly different purpose this year. It's not able to tell us, as it normally would, hang on there just a little longer. Easter Sunday is but three weeks away, because in three weeks' time, it is likely that we will all still be in some kind of Lent. Will we be able to gather by the hundreds on Easter Sunday at the altar? Probably not. Will we be able to smell the Easter lilies and daffodils and tulips at church? Doubtful. Will we be able to join our family and friends for a grand Easter feast and make ourselves sick on jelly beans and chocolate? I don't know that we will. And while I'm no predictor of the future, I do think it is safe to bet that we are all going to have an extended Lent this year, an extended time in the desert, an extended time of fasting from the things that we love, of praying for God's help and for His mercy, and of almsgiving to a greater and unfortunately poorer world. But while Laetare Sunday may not be able to be our signpost for an imminent, joyful Easter time, it can still do what it has always done. It can remind us that while the time in the desert may be extended, it will not be forever. It still points us to the Easter reality that even when all seems lost, even when all seems dead, life, abundant life, awaits for us. 
paradox of the Christian life is still true, even when our calendars and our lives and everything become interrupted. From death comes life because of Jesus Christ. In our gospel today, our Lord is teaching us concretely about this paradox. In a great act of power and love, he restores sight to a man born blind. Now think about it for a minute. This man was born blind. He lived in darkness for his whole life, literal darkness. Now we know what darkness is, both physically and allegorically. We're living it now. But even this pales in comparison to this man's life. Think about it. He never got to feast his eyes on the glories of creation. He was condemned from his birth to live a life without light, without color, without shapes, without images. And not only that, everybody thought that he was blind because he was a sinner, which meant he lived a life ostracized and marginalized, a life that was completely socially distant. And yet today, everything changes. Now think about us for a minute. We who do have sight, physical sight at least, we can easily take all of this for granted. We know how full and pleasant our lives are when our eyes are truly open. Now, the literal blindness of this poor man in our gospel today, and his allegorical blindness too, it becomes a fitting allegory for us and the blindness and the darkness that so often envelop us in this life. And when a Christian talks about darkness, we're talking about sin and the effects of sin. And we know that sin darkens our world and it robs us of the ability to see and to experience the beauty and the splendor of God's light. And though we are trapped in this blindness, Jesus offers us a way out. He descends into our world, into our world of darkness, into our world of sin. And by dying on the cross, he offers us the grace of his freedom. He dispels our darkness, and he opens our eyes to the light of his grace. But now thinking about this man, in our gospel today. He wasn't just a, a passive recipient of God's goodness. Consider the narrative that we're given. Jesus sees the blind man. He then spits on the ground, making clay with his saliva. He then smears it on the man's eyes and then tells him to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, in order for the man to see, he had to get up off the ground. He had to leave behind what he knew, and he had to go to the waters. The man blind had to hear the words of Jesus. He had to obey them, and then he had to change his life. Only then were his eyes opened. Only then could he see the light. And the same is true for us. Many of us pray day after day, year after year, for some particular kind of grace. Maybe it's for help to get out of a habitual sin, or for a healing of some kind of sickness, or for reconciliation with someone we've, we've had it out with. Now the Lord wants nothing more than to bring us out of darkness and into light. But we ourselves have to be disposed to receive His grace. We can't simply sit back and wait for God to simply wave his magic hand and make things better. What we learn from our gospel today is that he enters into our muck, into our clay, and he sanctifies it. And he smears us with his admixture of his divine grace and human compassion, but then commands us to get up and go, to change our lives, and to wash if we wish to see. My friends, our Lord is not going to wave his magic hand and make this whole situation that we're dealing with better. He's not going to make the coronavirus go away and we're all going to go back to life as usual. But what he shows us today is that he is with us in the thick of it. 
He's with us in the muck. And with his divine grace and with his love, he is working. But we cannot just sit around in the ground and feel bad for ourselves. We have to get up. We have to go. We have to wash. And we have to continue his mission. We are all at a place where we have to be socially distant and we have to do all of these precautions. But this does not excuse us from paying attention to the things of ultimate importance in this life. And Laetare Sunday reminds us of this. We are concerned with the coronavirus, yes, but we are still reminded that this world and all of its good things and bad things, it's passing away. At the end of the day, what matters most is the sin that we turn away from and the grace that we abandon ourselves to. Whether we are in a hospital bed, or sitting at home, distant from friends and family, or wherever we're at, the life of holiness must still be first and foremost and center in our life. We must still ask the Lord to give us sight to see, and we must be willing to go where he calls us, away from our sins and towards the light. You and I are in the same position, facing the same choice as the man born blind in our gospel today. Jesus comes to us in our devastation, in our muck, in our sin, and he extends his hand to us. Now the question remains for us. Are we willing to take his hand and to get up and to go? If so, we'll be ready to start anew. And we will be able to cry out like the blind man, I do believe, Lord, and then fall down and worship him. This, my friends, is the reason for Laetare Sunday. And this is reason enough, in fact, it's the only real reason ever, for us to rejoice and to be joyful. Holy 
the souls of the faithful departed, that through the mercy of God they may rest in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of the parishioners of the parish of the resurrection of the Lord, for whom this Mass is offered, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, hear the prayers of your faithful people. And as we call upon the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of St. John Henry Newman, our patron, and of all of the angels and saints, we ask in your goodness that you grant them all, through Christ our Lord. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, with the praises and glory of His name, for our good and good of all His holy church. We place before you with joy these offerings, which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully review them and present them to you as His fitting, for the salvation of all the world. Please, O God, we pray, 
to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. On this day, we told this peccato mu, misere nobis. On this day, we told this peccato mu, misere nobis. On this day, we told this peccato mu, dona nobis pace. Behold the Lamb of God. 
sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Christ. 